Well, welcome again, everybody, to another podcast, a Tower Wealth Advisory podcast. I'm Tyler. I'm Dave. And today we're here speaking with Daniel Cohen from Fiera Comox to speak about their private equity offering. Uh, private equity is something that uh, we used to only see in endowments, large pension funds, things like the Canadian Pension Plan have held private equity positions for a long time now. And some of these products are now starting to be experienced on the retail side or in the public markets, if you want to call it that. And it's a product that Dave and I have uh, used in some of our portfolios with uh, great success. So we're really excited to speak to Daniel here today. Daniel Cohen, as I mentioned, is uh, from Fiera Comox. Thank you for having me. And please let me know for whatever reason you're having issues hearing or seeing me. It, it appears to be good on my side, but uh, cognizant of the fact that we're doing this over Zoom, so I want to make sure that it, it resonates. Um, so thank you for having me. Just a quick introduction. So my name is Daniel Cohen. I joined Fiera Comox's global private equity team and Fiera Comox in 2020. Um, my prior role was uh, split between being a private equity attorney at Steichman Elliott based in Montreal, uh, but with offices all over Canada and abroad. And then after that, I was the CEO of a manufacturing business based here in Montreal, but with international operations before joining Fiera Comox. Um, and I have the pr privilege of working closely alongside the team before you from Wellington Altus. So I'm grateful for that. Fiera Comox is a private alternative investment manager. We have three different strategies uh, to date. The first is our agriculture fund. The second is our private credit uh, or private debt fund. And lastly, it's our private equity strategy. Our private equity strategy is what we're here to speak to you about today, or the asset class for that matter. And it's the only strategy we have to date that is available to the retail network in Canada. Now, in terms of the presentation that you're going to see, it's on a canoe financial letterhead. And that is because of a joint venture that we have and a partnership with canoe to help us distribute and make this private equity asset class that we manage available to Canadian retail. So that would be the product, if you will, should it be of something of interest to you that you would have access to in order to access our underlying strategy. And that would be available through Dave Tyler and their team um, at Wellington Altus. So with that, I'm happy to jump into it. So, so what is private equity and where is it positioned? Private equity is effectively um, private investments in businesses located anywhere in the world, so globally, which, it, which happens to be our focus. And really, um, private equity acquires and holds for a fixed period, and that period can vary, a capital investment in private businesses. Now, what that means to different investors or general partners, um, it can differ across the private equity landscape. But in general, that is what private equity investors seek to do. And we add value to the businesses that we invest in by supporting growth and also improving operational efficiencies of the business to create value for the underlying investors. And that's something that we'll touch on later on in the presentation. So traditionally, the way you can uh, break down the private equity ecosystem is between venture capital, growth equity, and buyouts. Now, as you move from venture capital all the way to buyouts, what you'll notice is the risk return profile of the underlying investment changes dramatically. So venture capital, which is uh, oftentimes what's occupying the headlines as of late, it's traditionally investments in ideas or entrepreneurs where the business is either pre-revenue or pre-profit. And typically the use of the funds in which you're investing into this business is for research and development, product development, and then also taking the product to launch and marketing it. Now, venture capital brings with it a high probability of loss, but that also brings the potential for very high gains. If we move into the middle of, of, of the table in front of you, there's growth equity. Now, the way we define growth equity at Fiera Comox, these are businesses where if they stood still today, they'd be profitable businesses. However, what these companies are doing is they're reinvesting their profits or cash flows into its expansion. And expansion can be either into new markets or geographies, but also through mergers and acquisitions, where you're growing through scaling by adding on uh, additional product lines or potentially buying out certain competitors. Now, growth equity happens to be a lower risk profile to venture capital from a total loss perspective, but still a higher risk return profile to buyouts. And buyouts is traditionally where a firm like ours, for example, happens to favor in terms of our investment strategy. Buyouts is where the businesses are typically more mature, 
They're profitable and cash flow positive, and it's maturing in its growth cycle such that the influx of funds or the use of funds will be used traditionally to recapitalize the business and increase profitability. But in a sense, what's often happening in a buyout private equity investment is certain shareholders are taking some money off the table. Whether it's all or a portion differs deal to deal, but that's the general essence of a buyout transaction. Now, these tend to carry the lowest risk profile between VC growth and buyout. Um, however, it's still, you know, they're downside protected deals, and there is a high probability of above market gains, which is what obviously a firm like ours would be chasing. So why invest in private equity in the first place? Well, first of all, Private equity is actually the largest asset class and is an important part of institutional portfolios. Most people tend to think um, that real estate, for example, is the largest private asset class. Well, in fact, it, it is private equity. Just in the US alone, um, the asset class represents tens of thousands of companies or 3.8 trillion of AUM. And that number continues to grow as businesses stay private longer. Private equity as an allocation to a portfolio also provides diversification to traditional investment portfolios. Private equity traditionally outperforms the public markets and other private asset classes, and it offers risk-adjusted compelling returns. One question we get asked quite frequently is, is there too much money chasing too few deals in private equity? The reality is it, it couldn't be further from the truth. So if we look at the mid-market, there are over 2 million companies in the US alone with over 50 employees. So these are not necessarily corner stores or mom and pops. They might be regional businesses that are looking to expand into, within their state um, or across the country nationwide. If we compare that to the approximately 4,300 publicly traded companies just in the US, what you'll see is the opportunity set for private equity investing is significantly greater than for public market investing. And what we show here on the screen in terms of some of the brands that you may recognize, like CCM if you're a hockey player, Dollarama, Tim Hortons, Canada Goose, we're actually showing what the trajectory can look like of a business that is private today, then receives a private equity investment from a firm like ours, and then can eventually be taken public through an IPO. So if you look in the far right column on the screen, Dollarama as an example, or even Tim Hortons or Canada Goose, which you might be familiar with, they were once privately owned by their founders and then through additional um, private equity capital once they had private equity investments. And then they became publicly traded companies today through an IPO. Now, as I mentioned or touched on in the previous slide, so the number of public businesses has actually started, it's not necessarily falling, but privately owned businesses are staying private longer than ever before. And so there is a broad and growing opportunity set in private equity versus a narrowing opportunity set to invest in larger public companies. And this is a trend that has been, that has stayed true since 2001 until today. And we believe that it will continue to stay true into the future. Now, one of the reasons why institutional portfolios embed private equity uh, into what they do is because private equity has a proven track record of outperforming the public indices across multiple time periods. So if we have a look at a 10-year, 15-year, and 20-year time horizon, so longer-term time horizons, which is what we would typically recommend for a private equity investor, not necessarily 20 years, but certainly more than five years, what you'll notice is that global private equity, which are the bars in red, have significantly outperformed the public equity indices over these time horizons, and in certain cases to this tune of two to one. Now, what we tend to focus on more so, and, and it just it's a function of our DNA, which is uh, being heavily, heavily focused on downside protection, we like to look at the resiliency that private equity offers as an asset class. So if you look at the top uh, half of the screen, what we show is the lowest five-year return between 1995 and 2020. So the lowest five-year return across all of the asset classes that you see on the screen. So private equity, uh, VC growth, you know, private credit, and then certain real assets. What you'll notice is that of all of the asset classes, private equity is one of two alongside private credit, where at its lowest point between 1995 and 2020, it still generated a positive return. And from a capital preservation or downside protection mindset, that is fundamental. Now, 
We overlay that with the fact that during the dot-com bubble of 2000 to 2002 and the global financial crisis from 2008 to 2020, private equity as an asset class outperformed global equities before, during, and post these crises, which again speaks to the outperformance, but also the resiliency of the asset class. Now, why is that? Why is private equity, why is private equity able to outperform other asset classes and be more resilient? Well, it's really due to two factors. One is private equity traditionally allows for a lower transaction multiple. So private equity investors like ourselves are traditionally able to buy private businesses for less than purchasing public peers to these companies. And if we look at different time horizons, so a five-year, 10-year, and 15-year average, what you'll notice is that there is an arbitrage opportunity or a delta between Russell 3000, which we believe is a fair benchmark to mid-market private equity and US middle market private equity of around one to two turns of a premium to buy the same business on the public markets versus private markets. What you'll notice today, and we show this on the far left um, bar graph, is the delta or the arbitrage opportunity today is significantly bigger between buying a private business or a publicly traded peer. Now, whether public market comps are coming down or will continue to come down, or private equity multiples are going to go up, um, we don't know. But what we do know is in either scenario, having exposure to private equity is a smart decision for the end retail investor. And the other thing worth noting is if we look at the data at the bottom right, at the bottom half of the screen, private equity owned businesses are traditionally able to grow, so grow their revenue quicker than the market or non-private equity owned businesses. And we'll touch on some of the levers that private equity firms are able to pull uh, once they make an investment later on in the presentation. Now, for all these reasons, so the outperformance of the asset class, its size, the fact that it's resilient and can outperform in a crisis, and the different levers that we just mentioned uh, in terms of once you make a private equity investment, for those reasons, gold standard investors, which are traditionally um, viewed as US endowments and Canadian pensions, and that's worldwide, for those reasons, they have been increasing steadily their allocations to private equity, pure private equity, like Fiera Comox does, from 8.2% in 2008 to approximately 23% in 2021. And for certain pension plans, that number hovers closer to 30% today. Now, one question we are asked, um, particularly through clients of, for example, Dave and Tyler's, is how does this, how does adding private equity to someone's portfolio impact volatility? Well, the reality is adding private equity, not only does it drive performance to a traditional portfolio, it significantly reduces the volatility. And so what we show here is by adding a 15% allocation to private equity to a traditional portfolio, significantly improves the Sharpe ratio um, and reduce its volatility. Now, th there are a few different ways to access private equity. So first of all, um, there are closed-end funds and there are open-ended funds. Now, closed end funds are traditionally, they have a term of anywhere from 10 to 12 years, depending on how long a firm can extend the life of the fund for. And typically you'd see somewhere between you know, eight and 12 investments made within that fund, and the funds can vary between sizes. Now, if you invest in a closed end fund, traditionally your investment in that fund will be locked up for the life of the fund. So call it 10 to 12 years. There are also certain open-ended funds, and Fiera Comox alongside Canoe's Global Private Equity Fund, which is what you would have access to through um, Dave and Tyler, that is an open-ended fund where there is no finite life to the fund. It is perpetual and evergreen. Each type of fund offers different advantages. However, they don't change the way a private equity investor can access the underlying asset class. And there are really three different ways in which to do so. There are direct investments where an investor like us takes a position directly in a private business. There are fund investments where an investor like us can make an investment in a fund, which will then make an investment in different funds or different underlying investments rather. And then there are fund of funds where an investor makes a commitment to many funds, which give you access to many different underlying companies. Now, the Canoe Global Private Equity Fund 
we create a balanced portfolio across direct investments and a sleeve of fund investments, but we are more focused on direct investments, which is what you would get through the fund that Tyler and Dave have to offer. So how does private equity um, drive performance? Well, we think of this in a few different ways. So first of all, a private equity investor like us, we have a, an information advantage relative to what you would have investing in the public markets. In investing in private businesses, you're really rolling up your sleeves and doing deep due diligence on one name, one company, one management team. And it allows you both to have access to information, but also to just conduct rigorous due diligence on all aspects of the business that you believe are fundamental to making a decision vis-a-vis -vis your investment in that business. So it really allows an investor like us to get comfortable from a, an investment perspective on any individual name that we might be diligencing at the time. It also allows us, at least through our structure, to have a long-term focus. So once again, we have a downside protected permanent capital mindset. And so when we make an investment in an, in an underlying company, we're not doing so for a daily trade or an hourly trade or even a weekly. We're really taking a five-year or longer time horizon view to our investments, which also is insulated from the public market's daily trading and quarterly earnings expectation noise that you would get with a relative peer in the public markets. So we're able, we're able to help insulate management to focus on the goals that we've outlined as being pertinent to achieving long-term milestones versus marching to quarterly earnings expectations. We're also able to um, take on more of an active management role. Now, this might not be with every investment that we make. However, with certain investments, we might have board seats and deep involvement and active involvement in certain portfolio companies, regardless of where they're located in the world. Now, for that reason, a private equity is a contact sport. So the ability to travel is obviously paramount. Um, particularly when you're investing across borders. But all to say, in comparison to what you would achieve through investing in the public markets, you're really able to roll up your sleeves and help the business into the future through your involvement on the board, but also through certain control mechanisms you might have in place from the time you make the investment. It also allows you to work with management from the get-go on the long-term plan and also think through what a likely exit strategy will be from the time that we make an investment. And those are things that we're considering when we're doing final due diligence uh, on any investment that we make. We also have a tremendous alignment of interest. So when we make an investment in a, in a direct company and we're doing so alongside management, it would not be uncommon for management or the, or the existing ownership that we're supporting to stay involved in the business and have a significant portion of their upside tied to how they perform alongside our ownership. And that's very important from an end investor's perspective to ensure that our investment is very much aligned with the interests of the existing management team. And, and then finally, you know, the inefficient private markets. So given their nature, private companies, they're prone to quick and deep value improvement. We have many examples of where we've achieved this in our portfolio from low hanging fruit, easy wins to more institutionalized backed improvements within the company. Um, and we're happy to touch on some of those examples in Q and A uh, or on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then we're also able to, you know, optimally use financial engineering at the time of the acquisition for growth purchases. We aim to source deals on a global basis. And so we really are able to leverage our network through our senior management team to help find deal flow. Um, and so that's something that, that we believe is important and fundamental to any private equity manager out there to really ensure, especially if you have a global mandate, that you're keeping your network up to date and you're able to deploy capital on a global basis. And just if I were to, to, to lend a few points um, just on the ecosystem, we've touched on you know, on certain points today. One thing that we're finding just from in light of the COVID-19 hangover, um, private equity has continued to demonstrate resilience by outperforming other asset classes and experiencing less volatility than the public market equivalents. One thing we've noticed is as investors continue to increase their allocation to private equity, firms with a defined ESG strategy connected to the investment and the value creation process will likely generate higher risk-adjusted returns for their investors. We believe that ESG integration is now a must-have 
for firms seeking to deliver attractive risk-adjusted returns within an increasingly competitive investment landscape. The other point I'd like to make is, and, and we touched on it before, is the number of companies that are staying private longer compounded with the number of private companies that private equity firms like ours can seek to make investments in continues to grow relative to public market equivalents. And so we're very excited about the opportunities that we see in the marketplace today. Thank you, David Teller. I'm happy to open it up to questions. Daniel, that's awesome. It's always kind of interesting to hear from you. The private equity market, I know, can sometimes be a bit uh, cloudy for you know public investors to even consider. So it's great that Dave and I have access like this to you guys. Um, one of the questions I had, and maybe you can, maybe you're allowed, or I'm not sure if you're allowed to speak to it, is just in regards to performance. You briefly touched on it just now, uh, but how how is the fund doing in a, an environment like what we've been in over the last uh, year, basically uh, since we've entered bear market territory? So how how is the private equity fund doing? Yeah, thank thank you both. So um, just given the nature of the presentation, it's hard for me to uh, to give that answer. Uh, just given you know, give the, that the is, you, you're you're able to. What, what I can say is that the underlying portfolio that your clients or prospective clients would have access to. It's done what we've set out to do. So it's delivered, um, you know, it's, it's helped volatility in traditional portfolios, um, and it has outperformed public market comparables uh, since inception. So what that numbers are, I, I, I'd leave to you, but, but those are the two, from our view, those are the two most important takeaways. And the fact that we've achieved those two points um, inception to date, so since 2018 is, is critical. Well, we can certainly have our attendees contact us directly sure. if they want to talk about. Well, how about this? It's positive year to date. That's probably <laughs> there you go. Enough to say something <laughs> like that, right? So, uh, I think. Uh, well, uh, we've got a few questions. We're going to ask. Uh, just open it up to the participants to uh, just type into the Q and A on the bottom of your screen there for uh, questions you want to ask, and then uh, I can move those questions along. Yeah, but maybe I'll kind of get the the ball rolling there, Daniel. I had a couple quick questions on. Uh, you mentioned that, and you're excited about this, but uh, private companies staying private longer. Uh, I didn't quite hear why that is happening, or or why you guys think maybe that's happening. Why are companies encouraging or encouraged to stay private longer and not go public? So it's an interesting it's an interesting point. So on the one hand, I think with private equity uh, gaining more traction across North America, particularly in the mid-market, which is where we play. So businesses with EBITDA of 10 million or more, um, what they're noticing is they have access to equity capital um, more so today than they ever did before, where they were forced to go through an IPO um, to receive some sort of recapitalization or inject of, of capital in order to, to grow their business. And so it's firms like ours that allow these private businesses to actually stay private longer. and. Most businesses would prefer it because rather than marching to these, you know, quarterly earnings reports and and all of the tape that's involved with being a publicly traded business, you're able to focus on, you know, what's made you great and continue to do so into the future. So it really does help push away all the noise that you would get with being a publicly traded company and focus on, you know, what what you're good at. That does make sense, I guess. And with more obviously inflows of investment, then they have more opportunity to stay private. Great. Great. Um, got a question for you then here. Um, so basically, maybe just describe. You know, you you did touch on it a bit, but the difference between when an investor purchases, say, uh, uh, an equity, either a stock or perhaps an ETF or a, a mutual fund, the difference between buying. An investment that's, I would say, liquid compared to buying, say, units in a, an investment in private equity uh, from the open end side. So, what what are the big differences? What are the, I guess, the pros and cons? I guess is a simple way of asking it. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the benefits you get with an open ended product, and there's many different ways to have an open ended product, but one of the benefits is you have. So it's it's a traditionally e liquid asset class, which private equity is. You can't just trade these. You know, each individual private business on a daily basis, but it allows investors to access the portfolio on a rolling basis. Um, so as the portfolio continues to evolve, new investors can access the portfolio versus being in a closed end fund, for example, where you you know there's one close, maybe two closes at the outset, and that's it. Um, we allow through the open ended fund for people to continuously get access to the underlying portfolio, and if there's a life event and there needs to be liquidity. There are ways in which the open-ended structure allows for that. However, it's still less liquid 
like you mentioned, or where you were going with it than a traditional mutual fund where you can trade it on a minute by minute basis. And that's just because of the illiquid nature of the underlying assets. Uh, great. Yeah. And I think that's a comment that uh, you know we can share here. I mean, for us talking with our our clients when we're explaining our portfolio mix and how we run money, uh, you know, we're somewhere in that neighborhood of 25 to 30 percent in, in alternatives in our portfolios. Uh, that's really what we say is about 25 to 30 percent of uh, your money where it would take us, you know, 30, 60, 90 days could take a quarter, could take a, a year sometimes, depending. I mean, sometimes uh, things get gated. Uh, so, you know, we just want to always be clear with them that although these are uh, more liquid than they've ever been, uh, it's still not the type of investment you try and hold if you're going to have to access this within a short period of time to to buy a house or any of those type of things. It's uh, it's it's not that liquid. It's liquid, but not that liquid. I don't know if there's a better way to say it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I think the way we tend to car- categorize it is, at least in the early days, it's there is liquidity if it's needed for, for example, a life event. But really, we encourage investors who are considering investing in this fund to have a five-year minimum time horizon for this investment. And that's partly because if, you know, based on the presentation that I just ran through, most of the data that we pinpoint is on a longer term time horizon, five, 10, 20 years. Now we recognize that tw- you know, most people can't necessarily hold on to one investment for 20 years. Um, and that's you know, partly why we built liquidity into what we do. However, really to get the true value of a private equity investment, you want to have a longer term view. Great. I got a few other questions. Go for it. You got any? Yep. Um, you mentioned briefly that you might get into some examples. Are there ones that you can talk on, Daniel, stuff that's sitting in the portfolio now that people might be familiar with or that you're excited about? So I, I can touch on some examples without naming names. Um, so, okay. you know, we've made certain investments over the last uh, year. One of them was in a healthcare services business in the U.S. So healthcare is a sector in which we believe is very resilient, specifically recession resilient, and one that's shown significant long-term, both previously and future uh, tailwinds in terms of growth. And so we're excited to be able to invest in that sector through a few different investments that we've made within healthcare services. So that's one where we're going to continue to invest in. Um, you know, obviously we pick and choose our spots because during COVID, certain sectors within healthcare were very expensive, and so we weren't um, we weren't ready to make those investments. And today, we've seen certain opportunities within the sector that fit more of the uh, price point profile that we'd look to in terms of multiples. And so we've had the good fortune of being able to make investments within that sector. We've also um, recently made investments in the craft beverage equipment space. So that's another sector, you know, craft beverage is one where we believe there's tremendous growth that's happened over the past decade and we'll continue to see that growth into the future. We're not the group that's going to pick the next best brand. So we don't traditionally seek to invest in, you know, more fad generated um, companies. We prefer businesses that are business to business services or financial services, healthcare services, industrial services, where Really, we're backing the industry or a, you know, a, a trend within a, a full industry versus picking one name that might be successful. And so we had the ability to make an investment in that space um, by rolling together six companies at once uh, and becoming one of the leading players in the craft beverage equipment servicing space uh, in the US. So that's another example of a deal that we've done recently uh, that we can point to. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, diversification was one of the, another another one of the notes that I made, uh, Daniel, and that's just I guess you made some comments about how private equity is a lot different from public equity. Sometimes that's hard to understand, in that you know these businesses function in the same environment as as the businesses that are functioning in the public equity markets. So how can they, or how can your fund produce performance when you know the public equity markets are getting slaughtered and you're still seeing performance in the private equity markets? Maybe you can speak to that. I guess it's, it must drill down into the very specific nature of the companies that you invest in or the markets that they're in. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's a bit of both. Um, so from a valuation perspective, I, I mean, the root of your question is how can you be you know, positive if the overall markets are, are negative? And really, that comes down to fundamentally, first of all, the, the businesses themselves that we're investing in. So it goes back to that point on our ability to do due diligence on one individual name. And the level of due diligence we can do 
on that one company is significantly different than the due diligence anyone can do with a public market company, just in terms of access to information, access to the management team, speaking with customers and suppliers, um, you know, doing reference calls, you're really able to go much deeper. And that allows us to build much more conviction in investments that we've made in private companies than we ever could with public with public markets companies. Now, is it, you know, is it a silver bullet? No. Is it a guarantee? No, but it does allow us to go and have more conviction in the deals that we do. So one element to the performance that Dave mentioned is the fact that we have built conviction around these companies through things that we've seen in due diligence. And the companies have performed very well over the last, you know, over the time horizon that we've made the investment. So underlying performance or operational performance of these businesses um, has definitely helped and been a driving force for our performance. Another driving force is the fact that we, at our firm, our strategy avoids sectors that are not recession resilient. So we tend to focus on businesses where we believe, regardless of what's happening with the macroeconomic outlook, that the businesses are poised to succeed. And so that obviously helps, you know, not being weighted towards um, technology or high, you know, any high flying tech companies has helped over the last six months. Um, not having any venture capital exposure or venture capital like companies exposure in our portfolio has also helped. So I think it's a combination of buying businesses that have performed exceptionally well and also staying away from sectors that have been um, hurt with the recent, you know, what's been happening recently in the public markets. So does your performance come from, as an investor, you're basically like a shareholder, your company is, and you're getting performance that way and, and, a, and a share value increase? Or is it when these companies are finally sold and you're recognizing profits that way? Or how does the performance uh, actually come into play as a, how does a unit holder or, or you guys as unit holders experience the growth in, the, in your investment? So there are valuations that are conducted based on, you know, company performance on a quarterly basis. Um, and we're also looking at you know, different uh, data points on a monthly basis to see if there are any changes that we need to factor into our valuations. Um, we also, you know, and then we'll do an audit and a third-party valuation at the end of the year. So there's, it's part to do with the valuation of the companies um, on an ongoing basis. And then also, obviously, whatever happens when the businesses are ultimately sold. Um, so those are the two ways in which investors would see the performance on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis. Got it. Uh, just a comment here. I, I know I've looked this up before, but uh, when you talk kind of the use of private equity um, in kind of portfolios uh, for the public, uh, and when we compare to how they're used in pension plans, endowments, things of that nature, I, you know, just from CPP's perspective, you know, here we are, 2022 um, makes up 32% of their portfolio as private equities. <clears throat> public equities, which traded on the stock markets, uh, only 27%. And if you look at the five year, uh, you know, that's it's range private equity 23 to 32%, but it's contributed to 45% of the total return of CPP's performance. So, it, you know, when you look at a traditional portfolio that we design, everybody's <clears throat> used to the 60 40, and obviously alternatives are, are gaining a lot of traction. Um, it's, a, it's a better way to balance the portfolio, obviously, from volatility, all the reasons uh, we talked about. Um, and I think probably for a retail investor, this it's still hard to get your hands on these types of investments. You have to be an accredited investor or you have to work through an advisor who is um, a portfolio manager, which can put that in your portfolio uh, without the accredited investor side of things. Um, but if you're working with an advisor who isn't a, a discretionary manager, you would have to go through a, you know quite an extensive set of forms to become and to sign off as an accredited investor. So they're still hard to get, to get in a way, um, but there are spots that you can put these in your portfolio to make your portfolio look a little bit more like CPP. And I'm not saying that CPP is the best portfolio in the world, but they've done a pretty good job over the years of managing the funds. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's true if you look across the board at the Canadian pension plan. CPP is obviously a great example because they, they're one of the heavier allocators. But on an average basis, like I mentioned, you're still looking at around 23% in terms of the allocation to true private equity across pension plans and US endowments. Now, are we here to say that, you know, a Canadian retail investor should have 25% of their portfolio in private equity? That's up to you to decide. And, you know, maybe for certain investors, uh, it's the right decision, but 
I think our view is more it shouldn't be zero, which has traditionally been the case. And that's part of our mission in terms of what we've set out to do with our strategy and through our partnership with Canoe is really give the Canadian retail investor access to an asset class in an efficient manner to an asset class that outperforms what they have traditionally been offered, um, but in a way that's palatable and digestible to the Canadian retail investor. Yeah, well, that's certainly what we've gotten. Um, any more questions nope. on your end, Dave? No, nope. we're good. Uh, well, you know, Tyler, I, 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 one thing I didn't mention, and it just ties back to what Dave just mentioned, is um, I touched on the difference between an open-ended and a closed-end fund. And yeah. one thing I think that you both appreciate now is two of the advantages you get with an open-ended fund like ours. So one is this concept of a blind pool. So you know, if there are any folks on the line that are actually interested and aren't currently invested in this portfolio and want to learn more about it, because of the fact that we're open-ended, when they speak to you about what we do, you'll actually be able to point to real-life examples of what's in the portfolio today. And these investors will get access to this portfolio the day they make an investment. Whereas traditionally in private equity, you'd only have a closed window to make an investment and you have no idea what the underlying assets will be in that portfolio. You're just going to trust that you know, the mission will tie to the underlying investments over time. So that, that's one point, this concept of a blind pool where you're both able to actually speak to the portfolio today. And the other is this concept of a J-curve. So traditionally, if you're investing in a private equity fund that's closed end, you're going to spend the first one, two, or three years while the fund is raising money, traditionally in a negative return environment, because you're being charged fees on committed capital before it gets deployed into assets. Whereas today, the portfolio is performing. There are 20 or more underlying investments in the portfolio today. And so this concept of a J-curve isn't necessarily as applicable today to a pri open-ended private equity structure as it would be to a traditional closed-end structure. So sorry, those are just two extra points that I wanted to make um, as part of the presentation. Yeah, that's great. I mean, traditional mutual fund, if you add your funds in, the manager would deploy it in days to their allocations where in your situation, uh, funds added, they might not uh, you know, be days. It could be a few weeks if you've got a deal pending or a month, uh, but uh, maybe even a bit longer, but it ends up mixed into the portfolio fairly promptly compared to, like you said, uh, a closed end holding. Great. Well, those are awesome comments, Daniel. Um, I think we can probably wrap it up there and, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Again, I know we've bumped into each other a couple of times over the last uh, few months, so we've been leaning on you hard for a little while here, Daniel. Uh, so we always appreciate your support. It was great seeing you and hopefully uh, one day we can do this uh, when you're out West here in Alberta. Thank you for having me. And as you both know, I'm always available. If ever there are people on the line who'd like to learn more, I'm happy to do you know one-on-ones with yourselves to be able to continue explaining what we do and how we're making it available to Canadian retail investors. So thank you again for the, for having me and for the time. That's great. Right. Thanks again, Dan. Thanks, Daniel. Bye for now. Take care. And to everybody else, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this episode of the Tower Wealth Advisory Podcast Series. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to towerwealth.com or follow us on social media. Thanks again for watching. Have a good day.